thank you very much for coming to this session on ESG. So we would love to make this an engaged type of discussion, and we're going to leave about 30 minutes for your questions after we take a little bit of time to introduce ourselves and have a discussion among the panelists. But to get things started, I would like to know a little bit about you. And so I had a couple of questions. One is, how many of you here know what ESG actually stands for? OK, great. So I think there's a certain level of knowledge. Um, but we hope to be able to, <laughs> I hope by the time you leave, you know a lot more about ESG. Uh, second question is, how many of you are looking or are in a career that does touch upon ESG? OK, great. So we hope by the end of the session, you maybe have a few more uh, ideas to, um, to think about in terms of your own career paths. So I will just take uh, a second to introduce myself very briefly and then ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. So my name is Mike Roundhorst. I'm a graduate from 1995 in the business school. I am a managing partner of a new startup uh, invest, impact investment manager called SEMA Funds. Um, we manage a $90 million off-grid solar and microfinance fund to distribute solar systems in Africa and Asia. So we're entirely in uh, lesser developed countries. I, um, I have another role too, which is a very lucky role, and it's basically the reason I'm here, in that I sit on the board of a couple of foundations. And one of those foundations went through a process, ver process very recently to adopt an ESG uh, strategy. And so that um, gave me a little bit of background about ESG and how you can use it to manage your assets to not do harm, but more importantly, to tilt towards a investment style that is more in sync with your long-term goals. In this case, we chose a low carbon strategy and it's a family foundation. So it's kind of like we're trying to look after our, our for the long term. As uh, Governor Duval said this morning, you want to pass it on, and I think that type of approach is, is uh, you know, very helpful in, in trying to get people to implement ESG strategies. So anyway, that's just a little bit about myself, and I'd ask, uh, or maybe just go down the line, MJ, to introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, is there one minute? Or is it okay? We can take a couple minutes. Good morning, Mary Jane McQuillan here. Um, I'm a portfolio manager and also I oversee our ESG investment process at ClearBridge Investments. ClearBridge, for those of you who don't know, is a global active equity manager. We have about 147 billion in assets under management and we have a goal at the firm to be 100% ESG integrated. And what that means is that we want all of our assets across the firm to have ESG analysis or factors applied in the consideration in our fundamental research. We have headquarters around the world and uh, our offices are in the New York Times if you ever wanna come visit. And I have about 23 years in working in ESG investing specifically. And so it's delightful to see so many people here who are already familiar. If I think about 20 years ago, there'd probably be one or two hands in the room that raised. Um, so thank you very much. Hi there, my name is Jamie Martin. I work in the Global Sustainable Finance Group at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we sit at the firm level and drive the sustainable and impact investing strategy uh, across our businesses and really seek to, seek to partner with Morgan Stanley's uh, businesses uh, across our institutional securities group, which is investment banking, capital markets, sales and trading, research, prime brokerage, et cetera, uh, across Morgan Stanley Investment Management, which is our, our own asset management business, and then uh, today, I'll really focus my comments from the perspective of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, which is our network of nearly 16,000 financial advisors uh, that in aggregate manage uh, $2.5 trillion of assets. Uh, and we really play a role in, in as, a, as a matchmaker, essentially, taking, taking product uh, and distributing it through, through our wealth management platform uh, with our, with our third-party uh, asset management uh, partners. Uh, and so we're, we'll talk a little bit more about the demand that we're seeing within our, our wealth management client base um, and this idea of really democratizing access to ESG and uh, impact investing. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's still morning. 
Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if you see me fidgeting a lot up here. It's a little, the lighting is a little bit weird. It's like when my five-year-old wakes me up at 5 a.m. with a flashlight. It's like <laughs> in my eye. Um, and we're like sitting perched on a tree branch. So um, I apologize in advance. Um, Elizabeth Seeger, I work at KKR. I'm Director of Sustainable Investing. I have um, sort of two roles there. One is our um, responsible investment efforts globally. So how do we think about ESG-related issues in the investments that we make? Um, a lot of those, the, a lot of my work is focused on private equity. Um, um, so if anybody has any questions coming from the, the keynote uh, conversation around private equity and responsible investment impact, I'm happy to try to address those. The other part of my role is KKR's impact strategy, which we announced publicly in 2018, uh, which is a, a dedicated pool of money um, investing behind the sustainable development goals. Um, and then in my free time, I'm on the board of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. I'm actually on the standards board. There's a two board structure there. Um, and I work on um, ensuring that SASB follows its um, uh, conceptual framework and uh, protocols to develop the standards that it uh, then puts out into the marketplace. Good morning. Um, my name is Jamie O'Dell, uh, and sec Jamie number two. You can refer me to Jamie to number two today. The, okay, Jamie O. Um, so I, I'm a portfolio manager at Goldman Sachs, uh, where I run a fund that invests in emerging and frontier markets with uh, a big emphasis and full integration of ESG and sustainability criteria. Um, it's a relatively concentrated portfolio, about 20 to 25 companies across the world. Uh, and we take a very active engagement approach to our investments as well. So we work quite closely with our portfolio companies uh, to help them improve uh, corporate governance, disclosure, transparency, and where it's appropriate, environmental and social practices. And we do it all uh, with the objective of enhancing shareholder value. So this is all about returns. It's all about uh, driving performance for our investors. Um, but we think especially in emerging markets where uh, disclosure and data is very poor and where a lot of the in institutional infrastructure and frameworks are not in place to, uh, to protect uh, all stakeholders that uh, taking a sustainability approach um, and working closely with companies is, is the best way to, uh, to generate returns over time. Okay, great. Thank, thanks to each of you for being here and for, for uh, bringing your expertise to our discussion. So there's sort of three themes that um, we'd like to highlight through the discussion. And the first theme is how effective is ESG as an investment practice in terms of financial returns to ESG, invest to ESG investors? And then the second is, do ESG investors change corporate behavior? So this is sort of, does this really make a difference in terms of the corporate practices of the uh, investees? And the third area of inquiry is, do investors, how do investors identify material factors? Materiality is a, is a uh, consideration in this, that both influence the long-term sustainability of the businesses as well as its impact on the environment or community in which they operate. So those are just sort of three general conceptual themes. But to get started, um, I think it would be great if each of the panelists could maybe help us define ESG. It's not a strictly defined term um, or group of terms. Uh, it is not just a series of investment criteria either. It's actually now a very large and growing um, type of asset. So I think it would be good if, if each of the panelists could give us a little more depth about their approach, how they look at ESG, and w um, where they see it going. And most importantly, give an example so that we can have some tangible examples to think about. Sure, thank you. Um, so one of the questions, one of the discussions that Michael and I had earlier was, uh, is ESG part of impact or is impact ESG? And I think there's a little bit of um, vagueness in the language of all these terms that are coming out today that you've heard, sustainable investing, responsible investing, um, ESG investing. My view as a practitioner is that ESG investing is an approach, it's a technique, and um, it falls under the umbrella of impact investing because I do believe that all of us on the panel do have an impact in our investments in one way or another. And so to 
look at ESG specifically as a, in my view, as, a, as more of a public equities, but I know it can be applied to other asset classes as well, um, where we are taking um, a consideration of material and relevant environmental, social, and governance factors in our fundamental research. So when I said earlier that our firm's goal is to have 100% integration, it's only possible, at least in my view, because every investment professional, so every analyst and every portfolio manager is the investment professional, is a stock picker, is a decision maker. And so for us to understand and be specialists in ESG for each of our sectors, whether it's consumer discretionary and food and restaurant companies, or whether it's uh, IT software with software companies, um, or hardware or banks, we have we look at the ESG factors by sector because we think it's most relevant when it's sector specific. So applying food safety concerns to a, a utility really wouldn't make sense or applying energy efficiency to a bank could to a certain sense make sense. Um, but our analysts are very focused on how to think about this because they're not just saying this is a nice thing to do, this is something because clients asked us. Going back in our long history, it's been very much about improving our investment analysis, making our fundamental research more robust so that we truly understand holistically what are those factors that I need to think about as a long-term investor. And so as we go through time with our investments, and we have a long history of 50 plus years of active equity management, we've observed changes that can happen in corporate behavior, which we can talk about in a moment. But just to sum it up, it's very much about the fundamental analysis, it's an approach to integrating, and it's about the return and about the impact from our view. Next, and I'll, then I'll talk about the uh, intermediary perspective. Sure, I mean, I, I could talk all day on the challenges around terminology, literally all day, and I know we don't have time for that. Um, but I, you know, I think that it is very important for us to be very clear about what we're talking about in every single case, because I think a lot of the I'm, I'm not a researcher, but I think a lot of the research coming out on the value of ESG investing is com is confusing the, the term and what is ESG investing. So, uh, for you know, j just to be clear, you know, ESG ESG investing. And I'm using it quotes because I would never use it in in real life. Is uh, you know, it could be there's screening in or out based on some attributes. There's uh, ESG integration, which is considering material ESG issues. As MJ was talking about material. ESG issues in the investment process alongside other components. And then we actually think of impact as differently, where you're actually intentionally investing in things with a, with a positive measurable impact, although we do all have impacts through every choice that we make. Um, when I'm talking about our efforts in responsible investment, I'm talking about that middle bucket, which is considering, like MJ was talking about, the relevant issues in the investments that we're making at the relevant time. Um, and so in the private equity context, as anybody who was at uh, the keynote heard, um, you know, we're investing in companies for a relatively long period of time. We're taking a large stake in these companies. We have the opportunity, and in some of us have the business model, um, and t actually focused on creating value at those companies by partnering with them over the long term. Um, and we raise money from uh, um, asset owners, so we're asset managers. And I, I'm gonna take a second, because I think Deval sort of used a lot of language that maybe people aren't that familiar with. LP stands for limited partner, those are asset owners, those are the people who invest in our funds, and then we invest their funds into companies. And the reason that's important is because limited partners, as he was explaining, do have a real significant impact on how we think about what's important in, in our investments. Um, and a lot of the um, uh, focus has been on what are our policies, how do we engage with our portfolio companies, that sort of thing. Um, one public example I think is really interesting um, is we made an investment, uh, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, <coughs> in um, a Unilever company um, then called Flora. It was the spreads business of Unilever, now called Upfield. And everybody knows Unilever has a, a significant sustainability strategy, um, is very focused on it. And they wanted a partner that would take their sustainability commitments very seriously. Um, and we did. We actually went to the table um, in the deal process and said, we take this seriously. We have a track record on this topic. We're going to uh, continue to commit to sustainable palm oil and, in fact, improve upon that commitment. And we spent a significant amount of time with the company over time building up 
um, I, I, when a company spins off uh, part of its business, you basically have to create a lot of the strategies, policies, and processes all over again. Um, and so we spent a lot of time working with that company and, and uh, they've uh, gotten a lot of great coverage just recently uh, around their commitments on that. Um, that's a particular example, but we have a number of others where we're, we're really partnering to help them over the long term. I'll pause there. I can go, I can go next. Um, so I think I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I'll just add a couple of things. So I, I think for us, um, finding companies that uh, integrate or think about or embrace environmental, social, and governance factors uh, as a means towards delivering sustainable profitability and growth is, is our principal goal. And uh, we think of it as an extension of our fundamental process, so probably in the same way that MJ does. This is, some, this is nothing radical or uh, transformational. It's just adding tools or perspective or questions uh, to the process that helps you identify um, both opportunities and risks. So we think of it as a lens to identify high quality businesses across, um, across our markets. Um, I think that the, the other thing that I'd mention is that I think that there is, so there is, it is a toolkit, but I do think that it is a philosophy as well. Um, you can give the, 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 you know, the checklist to an analyst uh, or to a portfolio manager. Um, they can go through that, but if they don't believe in it, if they don't believe that these factors, the material factors, actually drive returns or, or help mitigate risk, um, it's not a particularly useful process. So part of it, it in, internally at Goldman is about um, making sure that people do understand uh, the ways that this creates value and, and mitigates risk. And the last thing I'll say is that, um, to that point, so many people, I think, do think about this as a risk mitigation tool. They're trying to, um, they're trying to find companies that are going to avoid uh, bad outcomes because of their ESG profile. But it's in our markets, and especially in, in emerging markets where um, you have companies that are addressing real needs for, for people on the ground, finding companies that, uh, that, that think about this as an opportunity set, whether it's financial inclusion or um, uh, health and safety, uh, or, or, or perhaps something on the, um, on the environmental side, uh, these are things that uh, we, you know, we believe are opportunities that allow them to have comparative and competitive advantages that can, um, that can sustain over time. Yeah, and um, auto shop in. So again, from, from Morgan Stanley's seat as kind of the intermediary or, or the matchmaker, one thing we find helpful, in, and again, there's lots of jargon around ESG and sustainability and impact, and at the end of the day, they're, they're, um, they're used in, in many different ways. But one thing we, help, we think helps really clarify around, around ESG or sustainability, sustainable investing, is there's the ESG process, which I think you, you heard uh, all these guys just articulate their, their process, and then the, the pro there's also ESG product, right? So in order to really have a credible product in the market, you better get your, your ESG process right. And I think you, you're hearing from, from Clearbridge and KKR and, and DSAM that you know, they've spent a lot of time really are being able to focus on their process, and they can articulate how integrating ESG into their investment process actually adds value uh, to their investment thesis. Uh, and that's very important for us at Morgan Stanley to really dig in on because at the end of the day, our clients, right, in, in the wealth management side are individuals and families and, and smaller institutions uh, that are coming to Morgan Stanley. They're, they're paying a financial advisor for advice to help them grow their assets. Uh, increasingly, they're very much focused on uh, expressing their values and their worldview around sustainability in their investment decisions. They're paying attention to the brands they're supporting, where their food's coming from, how efficient their cars are, how efficient their homes are. And we're seeing that consumer behavior really trickle over into their investment behavior. Now, investment behavior is just different than going to the supermarket or going online and, and kind of picking off which, which uh, brands you're supporting. People are very risk adverse when it comes to their money. And so again, in our process, uh, kind of the due diligence process when we're evaluating managers to bring on to this investing with impact platform, uh, we really want to be very uh, focused with, with, with our partners and, and understanding the nuance to their different approaches. And then again, as our matchmaker role, really being able to play that back to our advisors and our clients so they can understand you know, which one is the best fit to ultimately meet their clients' goals. Clients have very different financial goals. They tend to have very different impact goals as well. Uh, and this is, uh, again, something we spend a lot of time on trying to educate people across that, that spectrum. I just wanted to comment because I forgot to comment earlier. Um, so 
I work in, or we work in um, public equities, and we are not only trying to provide long-term shareholder return, but we're also trying to achieve some sort of impact. And interestingly, when we work with our clients and work with other advisors, many have had a reaction over the years that um, public equities, you can't get impact from public equities, and because everyone takes for granted that it's the second largest asset class, and everyone has some exposure to public equities, and they kind of um, isolate the impact investments to be more of these microfinance or private equity deals or direct investments, and they don't necessarily associate stocks uh, or companies to be um, involved in impact. And I don't think it can happen just naturally. I think there is a lot of active ownership, like those of us on the panel, are involved in to make this happen. So on the one hand, the scale and the size of these companies, corporate behavior could have a very negative impact, but corporate behavior could also be used or moved or directed toward the more positive. So I just wanted to mention that because I know um, many of investors we've worked with just didn't think of public equities as an option. Um, within in the impact space. But when I think back uh, over the years, there are companies that we've engaged with, um, such as a Home Depot or such as a um, Nucor, which is a steel recycling company, such as a Discovery Communications. And we don't have time to go through every example, and we publish a lot of information on our website. But those are examples where over time, as a long-term investor, Average holding period for us is seven years. The average of long-term managers in the United States is 1.7 years. So this idea of long-term investing gets thrown around a lot just like ESG does, but to truly make a difference, you have to have that concentrated, or you should have a concentrated ownership, which many of us have, being a top five owner, a top 10 owner, has helped really have access to management, direct the communication around how they can improve on shareholder return as well as impact, and we've seen this happen um, in our experience. Great, so that's a perfect segue to my next question where I'm not gonna do it successfully, but I wanted to try to channel just a little bit of Greta Thunberg who's, you know, I, I went to see her with my kids a couple of weeks ago, and it was just so impressive and saying, yeah, but you guys are just making profits at the expense of the future. So, so this is kind of the next question I, I wanted to ask is, do ESG factors actually create change in the governance uh, practices, or sorry, in the practices of, of the companies? And maybe we'll just skip over you for a second, Mary Jane, and, and, and go to uh, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, Jamie from Goldman Sachs. Uh, so we have Jamie from Goldman Sachs. We have Jamie from Morgan Stanley. We really need Jamie from JP Morgan here to have it really be a really good panel. Um, so uh, the, uh, I think, um, again, I mean, I think Jamie was mentioning there, there's a kind of a toolkit, right, at play here, especially in, in the public markets that investors have. And I think, again, you can take different sides of the argument about the, the public equity space and, and the impact that it'll only have. Uh, we divide in the thinking about the public markets and thinking about investing in public companies um, into kind of a bifurcated uh, approach where you have, um, you know, impact solutions, right? Where So what are the, what are the uh, revenues that a company is generating that are contributing uh, from products and solutions that are addressing specific sustainability challenges, right? So you can measure that by a specific revenue, whether it's, you know, related to, uh, you know, climate or affordable housing. Um, and then you also have what we call sustainable corporate practices, right? So as a business, businesses increasingly have lots and lots of power in this uh, current environment. And so there are decisions that a business can make in terms of trying to be an inclusive workplace, in terms of different policies. Uh, and that can be a little bit more of kind of a yes, no, is the company, uh, you know, being intentional about trying to activate its, its business model to create value for all of its, its stakeholders. And so as uh, investors in aggregate, you know, again, there's lots of power within the investment community to signal what is important to companies and, and try to shift corporate behavior uh, to be more focused on the long term, as, as MJ was mentioning. Uh, in the past, investing has in, historically not been a very transparent industry. A lot of what this is all about when it comes to sustainability and ESG, we feel at Morgan Stanley is really just helping our clients understand what they own and helping them understand if that's aligned with their values. We actually just launched a new tool that I can explain in a bit that really helps our clients kind of get really much better insight into that called Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient, uh, where we can basically x-ray a portfolio and make a determination of how aligned or unaligned the portfolio is with what that client cares about, rather than Morgan Stanley saying, oh, your, your portfolio is an 88.7 or a dark green or a triple A. Uh, each, each kind of experience is really 
uh, customized to, to match the client's view of the world. And then the idea is once they get a better in, intel into what's in their portfolio, uh, they'll be more incentivized to potentially switch into products like we're talking about from ClearBridge and KKR and GSAM uh, that are really taking these considerations into account. Um, and, and just to put it in perspective on this investing with impact platform, I mentioned we have $30 billion in assets, which is a big number. We're excited about that. Uh, we've raised that over the past five years. But Morgan Stanley, again, we're, we're managing over two and a half trillion dollars, so it's still a little drop in the bucket. But if we can, you know, these are long-term trends, and if we can steer it in the right direction, it's going to have a lot of implications for the cost of capital and what, what ultimately are the winners and losers in, in, this, in this market. I'll go. Okay. Um, I, I, well, to answer the question first, if we want a sus sustainable economy, market, or society, um, investors have to be part of that. Um, are we doing a good job right now as a community? I would say no. Um, are we making a lot of progress or having um, impact? I would say yes. And I think um, I've been at KKR 10 years now entirely focused on this work the whole time. Um, the amount of momentum and progress I've seen in the last couple of years um, exceeds what I saw in, in the five years before that. And so there is um, a lot of momentum. And I think um, uh, I hope Greta would see that maybe in a couple of years, the <laughs> that we're, we're actually having uh, some impact there. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, I think that, you know, a couple of signs that I see um, that investors are really, I, the answer is yes, investors do have an impact on, on corporate action. Um, and I see a couple of signs that we're going to be seeing a lot more of that in the future. Um, so one is uh, last month I was in Paris at the UN Principles for Responsible Investment annual in-person event. There were 1,800 people there, um, which is the biggest they've ever had. Um, and it was, it was a large mix of in, mostly investors who were there, um, all focused on how do we actually achieve outcomes together. Um, a huge focus on climate change um, and other issues as well. And, and I see a lot of collaboration starting to occur between investors um, on these topics that I think will change corporate behavior um, and have already. The other thing is just on SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which I'm a part of, there's a group called, uh, uh, which started here in the US, but is um, um, becoming more global over time. There's a group called the Investor Advisory Group, uh, which now has 44 members representing, I think, $33 trillion US dollars. Uh, we're not even, KKR is not a member um, of that for because I'm on something else there. Um, and uh, though that group of people are going around to companies and encouraging them to disclose information um, in accordance with the SASB standards for their industry. Um, and so, so there are two takeaways from that for me. One is companies aren't doing it yet. And so there's an opportunity for companies to, to do a lot more disclosure. And two, though, sort of the um, other point is that investors do care. These are financially material uh, uh, points. And um, the collaboration is really happening to drive companies toward uh, more action and disclosure on these topics. Yeah, actually, one just quick thing on the on the SASB point. So uh, our group also does Morgan Stanley's corporate sustainability reporting, and this year Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs did actually as well our first SASB aligned corporate sustainability report, which was uh, pretty interesting because um, in the past, you know, we've put out a sustainability report for over ten years. And basically, that report has always been treated as a, as a marketing document at the end of the day. This year, since it went through this, this SASB uh, framework, um, it got treated as an investor document, right? So that had to be signed off by fir full firm control or, or went all the way up to our CFO. Uh, and so it, it, it got a lot more attention internally in terms of the activities that we're doing. Because uh, again, and this is an evolution, it's become, people are waking up to the fact that investors are making decisions based on the material information that we're putting out through our sustainability report. Uh, we've talked to other co companies that have had a very similar experience, and I think, you know, again, uh, th there is impact internally in terms of getting more attention on, uh, you know, as a global financial services company, you know, we don't, we don't make widgets, we don't make things, we're in the services business, obviously, and so there are different things that we should be disclosing uh, about our activities that investors increasingly are taking action on, and so uh, I think SASB has really, you know, helped kind of bring that to the, to the forefront as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that for sure, and we've been... Um, We've been uh, disciplined adherence to the SASB approach um, since we launched our fund five years ago. Um, I'd add a couple things. So I think f first is there's no question that this is beginning to impact 
uh, corporate behavior. I think the announcements by the Business Roundtable a couple of weeks ago about the uh, shift in perspective with respect to uh, different stakeholders was an important moment. I think there's a cynical view that it was really a PR uh, document, but um, uh, but I do think that there's there's something uh, deeper there, um, and I and I do feel that the you know that one thing that they sort of buried in there was that they do believe that the stakeholder and the shareholder alignment will uh, will converge over time. Um, I actually think they should have led with that because I think for uh, for a lot of folks they they want to understand sort of what happens to the shareholder. We believe that when you take this approach, the shareholder does win. They may just not win over the next you know, month or quarter or year, but that over time, it's, uh, it's a way to, to create value. So that's one thing I'd say. Second thing, in our markets, um, our experience is that uh, so much of this behavior is born out of necessity. So I just got back from Cairo last week. Um, every company that I spoke to was talking about putting solar arrays on the roofs of their buildings or, or, or building uh, solar arrays of their own. Um, a lot of these countries have you know, serious fiscal issues. Subsidies are being removed. Uh, energy prices are going up. And so you have a grid parity dynamic that's happening across the world that suddenly makes these kinds of investments economic and attractive. And those investments are happening uh, not because they care about global warming, but because they care about their, their bottom line. And the third thing I'd say is that I do think that the engagement piece and helping companies understand sort of how their own um, interests are aligned with, with those of, of, of their shareholders is an important one. Great. So I think we've heard some very interesting uh, approaches and examples and insights, but uh, we'd like to leave the rest of the time to your questions. So please, uh, I don't know if we have a mic or here, I'll, I'll just pass you a mic and uh, go for it. Thank you. Um, my name is Julie Mirino Carella. I'm the director of the Women in Energy program at the Center on Global Energy Policy. It's a research center at CIPA, the policy school. Um, my question is, so are investors thinking about diversity as a part of ESG? Because research shows that companies that are more diverse in terms of race and gender tend to do better and have better returns than companies that are not as diverse. And there's actually a great faculty here at, CS, at the business school, Kathy Phillips, doing research on team dynamics and decision makings, um, and when diverse elements are, in, are introduced um, into teams, the teams tend to have better decision makings. Um, so I'm curious like, if your organizations are thinking about the composition of the companies that you're investing in, because I know we've talked a lot, a lot about sort of environmental, but the S and, G and the G sometimes gets lost. Um. Thanks for, thank you for that question, and it's absolutely top of mind for so many investors, not just ourselves, but others, including the actual investors or asset owners, too. And I would like to, if it's okay with you, just point out that Morgan Stanley's sales side, their quant team did a very good study, I think three plus years ago, on trying to measure, like you said, what is the impact in terms of ROE or return on equity, return on invested capital? Is there higher innovation, lower volatility? Um, and is there um, performance impact? And the study has gone, I'm summarizing it, but the study went over many years, over thousands of companies, and the result is that companies with higher uh, diversity, um, in this case, the study was focused on gender diversity, uh, that the performance out the out those companies with higher gender diversity representation outperformed companies had lower. What we're seeing across the world, though, is um, in some com countries will have a, a heavy hand in this where they are uh, requiring certain um, gender uh, representation at the board of directors of companies. So we're seeing companies, countries like in Scandinavia and in France, I think the UK, others where it's anywhere from 40 to 50% that they're trying to set a target. Companies will take some time to get there. Japan is now thinking about gender diversity even more so as well. In the US, the average board representation uh, for women is about 22, 23%. But this is not just gender diversity, but gender diversity overall, because what we're seeing in our director of research, who's got, I think, 40 years covering, or maybe 35, I shouldn't age him, but 35 years covering industrials, um, says to all of his companies when he meets with them, I'm tired of seeing you all look like me, meaning him. Um, 
middle-aged white man, and he said, I want to see more diversity, not just to fill numbers, but that he wants to see some different thinking at these companies as they enter into the next decade. And so he's been pushing for that, and he's gotten responses where we can't find women, we can't find people of color, and he's not accepted it and kept pushing it. And he, as the director of research, he's told all of our analysts, we have 30 of them, that they should be considering this as well. And they have on their own, because as you can imagine, certain sectors, um, diversity is very low, and other sectors, diversity is very high, but they're not necessarily promoting. So this is definitely an area that I think many investors are focused on. I would just add one thing to that, which is, um, so we, we push for it aggressively with the companies that we own. Uh, we think it's very important. Um, but we also are very cognizant of the tricks and games that a lot of these companies play when they're either reporting uh, these statistics, uh, especially at the managerial level. So de depends on how they define what management or what senior management is. Um, that can skew uh, how many women are, are, are included in those. And so uh, that's something that we, we pay attention to. And then at the board level, um, we see, see a lot of things like the son, of the, the daughter of the founder is on the board, right? So there's diversity, but it may not be the kind of diversity that, uh, that you're looking for. So um, drilling down into the details to really understand uh, what, what that diversity brings to the table in terms of skills and experience is something that we, we spend time on as well. Okay, another question? Hi, thanks so much. Um, I think a couple of you have touched on this, but I'm still um, trying to think about the answer to this question, which basically is if you have companies that score poorly from an ESG perspective and you decide to exclude them from your investing, obviously you can't really influence sort of the change in practices. So you've, a couple of you have given examples of either working with companies that already have high scores or the healthcare example influencing a company that had a low score. I guess I'm trying to understand in terms of the metrics of the products, how you weigh having an impact on the companies and their uh, use or implementation of ESG versus the problematic sort of rating that occurs for the investment. <laughs> it's a good question and that's one of the reasons why I spent some time defining or unpacking what is ESG investing, because there's the screen in and out way that you can do it, and then there's the integrate the considerations and, and then you know make that part of your investment thesis. Um, in private equity in particular, um, we're investing in companies that are underperforming all across the board on various issues, not just ESG issues, and, and working to improve them over the time of our investment. So. Um, it's not surprising that we're investing in companies that either um, haven't been performing as well or don't have the policies and procedures in place to do what they need to do in the future. And so um, in those cases, and in every case, we're seeking to take the company from where it is today to where it, where it should be. Uh, the other thing I'd say, too, is that I mean, certain managers have a real expertise in the shareholder engagement. A lot of that is... Um, you know, built upon decades of really, really engaging with companies at the right time, really building coalitions around, you know, and, and kind of getting the vote and, and, and not just showing up to the meeting and, and kind of missing the opportunity um, because, again, there's a lot of, a lot of pushback and, uh, on that front. The other thing that's happening as well, which I think is an interesting development in the uh, hedge fund space, hedge funds have notoriously evolved, uh, ignored ESG uh, over the years because there's this, you know, conception that you're going to be limiting your investment universe, and if you're a hedge fund, that is not something you really want to do, but uh, these activist hedge funds have uh, been quite successful, obviously, getting board seats and, and lobbying companies, and now you're seeing uh, ESG-motivated activist hedge funds, right? So they're taking, quote-unquote, brown companies, and they think they can unlock value and, and create money uh, by um, really embedding ESG and pushing the company to take sustainability uh, more seriously. Now, you know, there's both sides of that kind of approach and, and, uh, and how much impact is ultimately generated, but those types of um, you know, approaches are, are, just, are starting to pop up by very sophisticated investors. I was just going to quickly add it. We've also observed that there are clients who don't want anything to do with companies that are the worst of the worst. Um, they often will view them as high risk in terms of their operations and senior management and governance. Um, but we tend to take the view of thinking long term, 
but it's not concessionary. It's not like, oh, this company is so compelling um, on valuation and it's terrible, but we can make it work better. It's companies that we think have the potential. And if they have the potential, um, they may not be so strong on the ESG rating. They're not terrible, but they're not the highest. We will, we, and, and again, the financial part is there. We can invest in them and then actively engage them. But there are clients who will say, you know, we will never invest in tobacco and no matter how great the tobacco company is doing. It's, it's hard to justify that for them. Um, but I think increasingly we're seeing in our European clients that they like this idea of there are a lot of companies that are not leadership, and if we can help move them in that direction, they like that. But we also acknowledge there are some companies that at this time, they're just really difficult to work with, and even if we took a stake with them, they might be very difficult to change. Thank you so much. Um, MJ, I noticed you're wearing the pin for the sustainable development goals, and I think you, you, you've got the SASB pin, but this is a question about the sustainable development goals. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how those do or don't function in terms of how you do your work? In other words, are they just colorful tiles on websites, or are they actually playing a role in the work you're doing with these companies? Sure, and I think we might all have comments on this, but. Um, it's relative, from the private sector, it's relatively new in, in the past couple of years as far as the private sector. The public sector has always had to think about sustainable development goals through the United Nations work, but the private sector, I think, has recently been stepping in and realizing that we as investors and corporates and other entities can actually impact um, or try to contribute to, this, to the goals of the sustainable development goals, 17 of them, for those of you who are not um, aware. And they range from everything that makes a lot of sense, fighting poverty, gender equality, clean water, clean air. These, I don't think anyone would dispute that these are important goals. I think what we're all as an industry trying to now do is align where we place our capital on behalf of our clients, where we can actually try to get more impact in line with the sustainable development goals. So what we've done, and I'm sure others will have comments, is we've taken it by sector and then by industry, and then within the industry, try to map what our investments are and what goals they can impact. So as you can imagine, um, the goals are on health and well-being, Many of our biotechnology and um, healthcare stocks are trying to align in that direction. So if we took, for example, CVS, which is, we all know is a drugstore and pharmaceutical and PBM, they um, try to align to health and well-being through their work on, amongst other things, through their work on opioids. And they believe that they can actually, as a distributor, have a very big impact in trying to reduce the amount of opioids that are excessively being distributed. And they have a whole series of policies and training programs with their pharmacists, working with the managed care companies, working with employers to try to reduce it. So that's an example, one small example. One that we um, talk about a lot is the apparel industry. So are companies that are apparel manufacturers and retailers, what SDGs can they affect? And our analyst maps it to every single E, S, and G, and down to the goal. And the three that he most commonly thinks about, and I'm going to forget it right now, but it's related to equal equality, equal work, and fair wages, um, sustainable communities, and one other. So we're in early stages, and we think this is something that we have to focus on. This is not, this is an imperative. Um, but how we go through that process, I think everyone is trying to find out what works best for their investments. I mean, I think just for, we break it down to basic principles, which is, um, especially in emerging and frontier markets, the sustainable development goals identify the problems, right? These are the biggest challenges that face the people in these countries, and where you can find private sector solutions to address those issues, boom, business opportunity. And so where we can find companies that are uh, leveraging that, um, that, that to us is a, a potentially interesting investment. I, ha I have a complicated point of view on the sustainable development goals, but um, I'll answer your question by saying that for our global impact strategy, as I mentioned, we're investing in companies that, uh, whose core product or service is helping to achieve one or more of the SDGs. Um, but we think of that as being very different from how the comp company operates from an ESG perspective. And so when we look at a company from the impact um, perspective, we're looking at what's its core product or service? Is it providing a solution? 
And then we're also looking at how is the company operating on ESG issues as defined by SASB. Because uh, we think from an impact uh, fund strategy perspective, you can't talk about your positive impacts without managing how your company is affecting its stakeholders in the environment. So I see them as two different things, um, and we treat it differently in our impact strategy as well. Yeah, and I just also point out that, I mean, the SDGs themselves, you know, weren't necessarily written for investors, but, but and I do think there's this idea of SDG washing. However, companies are now uh, adopting it to kind of inform their strategy. We did a, an SDG-linked bond for a company called Enel, which is a big Italian utility company, and so what they said is they had a goal internally to take their renewable energy mix from 45% to 55% by 2021, and they went out and they wanted to raise money to help do that. If they don't hit their goal, there's a 25 basis point step up in the coupon of the bond, right? So they would be penalized uh, by their bondholders and, and the investors would actually be rewarded, uh, again, so in terms of the incentives around this, if they don't um, hit their sustainability goals, which is an interesting um, development because what that allows them to do is really uh, align their sustainability strategy with their, with their funding strategy, with how they're actually funding their business and how they're tapping the capital market. So it'll be interesting to see if there's kind of a follow the leader approach there, and, and I think there's a lot of work. I mean, we're green bonds, there's blue bonds, I heard SDG bonds are now called rainbow bonds, so uh, there's more there's more, uh, there's more progress, but again, and their skepticism, right, is that just a marketing activity, and they would, if they just raised a regular bond, would they have just gone out and done that uh, as well, and, and so uh, I think the market's going to clear all that, investors are going are gonna to call out companies that, uh, you know, don't deliver and, and just use it as a marketing excuse. Sorry, I just have to add, someone asked me earlier this year with this pin, they said, is this a pride pin, <laughs> because... Well, thank you for that color. <laughs> Could we just go to this side of the room? Hi. Uh, you talked about, Jamie O talked about a little bit about this or touched on it, that from a long-term perspective, you expect that the performance of the companies uh, financially, not just from an investment perspective, but that they should outperform other companies generally. But right now, do you feel that this is an activist type of approach in the short term? And where do you think this type of attitude of ESG is going to really take companies in terms of their actual performance? So, look, I think I'd say a couple things. Um, First, I do think that, in, that, that companies that are thinking about the alignment of ESG with their, with their fundamental business um, are doing it in a way that is focused on the long-term value creation, i.e., if they can retain their talent, if they can uh, maintain um, a, a healthy relationship with regulators, uh, they are in a better position to determine their own destinies. And that, at the end of the day, is what everybody's trying to do. You've got a world of exogenous factors, interest rates, currencies, inflation, regulation, um, commodity prices that are affecting your, your businesses. Um, if you can insulate yourself as much as possible via using or adhering to some of these practices, that, that should set you up for superior performance over time. The second thing, though, that I would add is that you never really know when the long term is going to become the short term. And I think that's something that we see, especially in emerging markets, um, where something that you thought was, you know, 10 years away, whether it's carbon pricing or some sort of regulatory activity uh, or a competitive dynamic, um, emerges much more quickly than you expected. Um, and so uh, being in a position uh, to, um, uh, to, you know, to navigate that new operational challenge is, is something that we also want to make sure that our companies can do. So uh, the long term is critical, and that's the way that we think about it philosophically. But we do think that um, that they're th by doing this, companies make themselves more both nimble and more um, uh, insulated from from these external factors. Okay, and is there anyone? Wait, you've worked hard to get to the back of the room. Somebody from the back of the room, maybe. All those steps. Hi, so we're living in super complicated times and climate change, geopolitical change, all these vectors coming together. 
And I feel the tension between these kids who are marching out there, the Extinction Rebellion, the Climate Change Rebellion. And I sit and I listen to the panel of amazing leaders. And so I want to try to understand um, how we bring this tension um, of the kids marching and the urgency of the kids marching to some of the work that you're doing as leaders. And what does this look like? So both in your personal life and your day to day, how do we start pushing the systems that we have that clearly aren't working. I, you know, Melinda Gates said the other day that it's going to take 220 years to create gender equity in America. So maybe we should look at the Nordic models, but what are, you, on a personal level, are each of you doing to try and speed it up? Because I don't personally think we have 220 years right now. Well, um, I'll just take a first shot at this, but I think when I think back to our early days um, when we started ESG investing, um, there are different periods in time where there were big movements. Um, maybe it was South Africa divestment, maybe it was environmental and Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, um, maybe different activities or events that took place that caused people to galvanize and to speak up and have a very grassroots approach. And for my own personal observation, I won't speak for everyone here, that actually has helped in many ways. So when we talk about ourselves as owners of shares and we're like, oh, we, we, we're a top five owner and we can talk to the CEO anytime we want, um, that's helpful and that's, you know, it's important to those companies to know that owners care. But it's also important and we credit a lot of the work that many of the um, college students and the activists, and Clearbridge in previous years was known as Solomon Brothers, Smith Barney, Citigroup. And I remember when we were in one of our headquarters buildings about 10 years ago, the Rainforest Action Network was doing a whole campaign on financials. And so they were climbing our building and we were having a meeting and they waved to us from outside on the, on the tower and they said, you know, we just want you to know we're thinking about any of the investments you're doing in underwriting and investment banking. And it caused, for right or for wrong, and is that the only way that can happen? But it caused the company, senior management, to get together with RAN and talk about things like the equator principles and coming up with ways that, before you lend money, do a lot of due diligence on the environmental and social assessments. Still, work, more work can always be done, but sometimes you need that little catalyst or that you know, and I'm not saying that's the only way, but to the point of the activism that's been going around, particularly with the young people, uh, my own daughters are and were marching on climate parades, uh, at climate parades with their schools, and they were given permission to leave the school, and holding signs and on New York One News, and I think that involvement is really important. I don't think you could just have the investors, but on the other hand, I don't think you can just have you know, the grassroots upstart, they need support institutionally as well. So we see this as a way that we can partner with various initiatives, um, whether it's on climate or whether it's on human rights. Um, this is an important area that all of us can work on, if that's a short answer. Can I answer that too? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I was going to take my own stab at it. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, you know, this is a systems challenge, right? We need a systems level change to get to where we need to be around um, meeting the SDGs um, or, or, you know, reducing the temperature of the planet and, and reducing inequality. And I think the, the youth and climate movements are, are calling us all out on that. I think, you know, we are operating in, on behalf of our institutions, obviously, in, in, the, in the capitalist system, and we're trying to affect change inside of our organizations. Now, there's, real, there's contradictions in that, right? There are activities that our institutions are doing that are not aligned with what we're talking about today. It's very hard just to turn that off overnight. I think we are, again, as, as we think long term, starting to change in the, in the right direction on this front. We're doing things internally at Morgan Stanley around, you know, pr pricing carbon into how we're giving internal credit rating, uh, ratings to, uh, you know, prudential um, um, projects and companies that we're, we're underwriting, which is a new development. There's a lot of regulation that's coming down the pipe, especially in Europe right now. Now, um, it's not obviously here in the U.S. under the current administration, but I think um, I would certainly, I'd encourage you to look in the EU uh, sustainable taxonomy for kind of some real guidelines as to what actually qualifies as an ESG type investment, what qualifies as actual green bond, and, and they're going to try to embed that into their you know regulatory framework and uh, mandate that asset managers disclose their, their carbon exposures, which is going to have, you know, implications throughout the capital markets. And then on a personal level, the one thing I, I, I do encourage folks, again, and it goes back to a little bit where I started, right, is it's like, 
know what you own, right? And that maybe, you know, if you're a student, graduate student, you don't have a, you know, a huge, you know, investment portfolio, but understand what's in your portfolio. If you don't, understand, you know, what's in the portfolio of uh, the school that you're attending? What's in the portfolio of the nonprofit that you're supporting? Um, I think in increasingly, again, this is becoming much more transparent in a digitally connected world, and so it is a lot easier to know that. Uh, and then, yeah, ask questions, um, because I think, again, collectively, we can, if we, if we can better understand what we own and how that's aligned with a more sustainable and just world um, that can, over time, lead to uh, some positive outcomes. Can, I'd like to also address that because I think the, the point on personal accountability is so important. And when I answered the question about the investor role in driving corporate behavior, what I really wanted to say was the missing link is customer behavior um, and how do we make decisions on a daily basis. I am not an investor. I'm actually an environmentalist who decided that this was the best way for me to have an impact doing this work. And to your point, if you guys look at my Twitter hand, I have no followers, but I'm Bluebird, I am a Bluebird Tweets, um, and my uh, bio says Eco Girl in a Material World. Um, because that's what we're, you know, I have a passion, and I'm doing what I can in the role that I'm in. Um, and I, I think everybody has to do that as well. So thank you for asking that. I'll just say one thing really quickly, and then I've got a Suburban waiting for me outside, so I'll, I'll leave. No, I'm kidding. I'm taking the subway. I'll go with it. Um, I'll go with you. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, at, at Goldman, there are two things I just mentioned. One is I think there's a real recognition that in order to attract the best and the brightest, you have to live the values that, that the young people or that this new generation um, is espousing, and I think that's something that, that, um, that's really important. Uh, the second thing is, um, you know, there's a new business that's been established at Goldman to help our investment banking clients. So this is this is basically taking the knowledge and the uh, the experience that we've learned on the asset management side and moving that into the investment banking world to help companies address a number of different sustainability or ESG goals that they may have themselves. And so um, I think this is not something that we came up with, i.e. it was a product of demand, but you really are seeing uh, the corporate world, and this is, you know, this is the S&P 500, um, really thinking much more deeply about these factors. And this is not about PR, it's about how to uh, really embed these best practices into their businesses, and that's something where Goldman now sees an opportunity to, to do, uh, to make a new business. Great. One lightning round, um, maybe you. Quick question, and we'll answer it within uh, yeah, two minutes. Yeah. No, just, just, just one. Oh, okay. Sorry, I mean, we really can only take one more question. Um, a lot of my work is doing ESG disclosure analysis, and what my team has seen as a pattern is that companies tend to disclose past achievements instead of like long-term goals. So my question is, how important is to investors for companies to provide long-term metrics and forward-looking metrics? I would say it's very important. I said one of you know, and part of our engagement work is to get companies to disclose because when they disclose, they're being measured and it's very public. So once you put it out there, you can't really take it back. You actually have to to work towards those goals. But I agree with you. There are a lot of companies that are hesitant. Maybe it's their general counsel, or maybe they don't know how to measure it. They don't know which goals to put out. But we applaud companies that correctly or uh, sincerely put out targets and goals to track themselves so that we can f follow their progress as well as they can. So I'm going to cut you off there. But one more final question, because this is Columbia University. What advice would you have to the students about getting into the uh, ESG sector? What skill sets, what, what uh, approaches? Um, so I think that the, the, the biggest challenge that we have when we're hiring is finding people that can marry both the hard skills of investing with the uh, ESG or sustainability perspective. Um, they typically sort of or historically have occupied one or the other sphere. I think that's beginning to change and obviously with Columbia's uh, efforts, um, I think that, that, uh, that, that's, that's changing. But I think the hard skills are critical um, you know, sort of to, to, uh, to your point, um, uh, you know, th there is a lot of change that can be affected via, uh, via finance or an operational role at a company. 
um, but you've got to be able to uh, have the hard skills to execute. I'll say there are a lot of different ways to get into this space. Um, you can have a lot of different backgrounds. There are a lot of roles that need to be played, whether it's on disclosure, whether it's metrics, whether it's investing. Um, so build your own path. I had to build mine. Uh, I'll give two shameless plugs for ways to build your building blocks in a space. One is uh, looking to the Sustainable Investing Challenge. Morgan Stanley is a sponsor. Uh, we do it with uh, 60 business schools around uh, the world each year where you actually build a sustainable investing product and then get judges like uh, from the folks uh, on this panel to learn if that product can be scaled through the capital markets. It's a great experience. And the other one is we have a fellowship uh, for Columbia each summer where we bring students from CBS and SEPA to Morgan Stanley for the typical kind of summer associate experience, but you've got a, a focus on a sustainable investing set of projects for your summer. So if that's of interest, I highly recommend you look into that and uh, apply and uh, come, come hang out with us. And I'll just very quickly say it, that it's a great time right now to start looking because there are so many areas, whether it's working for a company, a private company, or a public company, working in government. And we really could use a lot of talent and passion in the government, uh, public policy space. Um, also working in investing is, is an area that's very exciting. But the one other part I will mention is um, Try not to give up. Try not to get dissuaded. Um, you know, I think of all of us, we probably have faced challenges, doubters, people saying, you know, you really shouldn't be doing sustainability and investing together. If you can keep yourself self focused on this, this is something that I think will will carry itself through. But it's just at times you might feel like, is this really what I want to do? And I think the answer is yes. Wonderful. So just we will try to post some resources on the website for the conference as well. Some of, some of them were mentioned here by the panelists. I really want to thank all of you for your questions, your attention, and your uh, sincerity in, in looking at this field as a way to build a better future for all of us. And especially thanks to the panelists. All of you were great. Thank you.